Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to today's webinar. I'm very pleased to say that we have a fascinating um, interview taking place today, uh, where I'm going to be interviewing um, the industry leader um, and on electronic invoicing and the future of e-invoicing. And we're also going to be looking at live benchmarking as well. We have a series of eight questions coming up over the course of the 60 minutes, um, which will hopefully help you understand what the future of e-invoicing looks like to you. So I extend to you a very warm welcome indeed. My name is Susie West, and I am your host today. And for the benefit of those that aren't familiar with me or sharedservicelink.com, um, I set up sharedservicelink.com in 2007 to serve as the leading business community for finance and accounting shared services professionals. And we serve as a platform where they can come together and mind, mind share and share information, share best practices, share horror stories, and talk frankly together about what technologies work, what solutions work, and best practices uh, that serve them to ensure that adoption levels are as successful as they can be. And we share this information via our conferences and via our webinars, such as this one today. So a, a key solution is, of course, in this market, electronic invoicing. And this is a subject that is at the front of mind, front of mind for a lot of finance leaders right now. Um, so I'm very pleased that we are having this debate today. So just before I, I move to introduce um, the gentleman that I am actually going to be interviewing today, I'm just going to run you through the agenda for the next 60 minutes. Um, we, I'm going to be introducing my interviewee, and then I'm going to be asking him to really talk about um, the definition of e-invoicing and the current state of e-invoicing, and then for him to talk frankly about what the future looks like in his opinion. And of course, the future of e-invoicing also is re reliant to a greater or lesser degree on certain influencing bodies and partnerships and collaborations within this market. So I am going to be discussing this with him too. Um, we're then going to be putting aside 10 minutes for your own questions. And I, I urge you, this is very much a Q&A uh, dialogue that we've got here over the next 60 minutes. And and I know that the future of e-invoicing is very important to you. This is why you're on this call. So if you feel like we haven't touched on a subject um, that you would like us to, you can get the answer to that question by submitting a question to me. And uh, you do that by um, entering your question into the free text box in your GoToWebinar panel. That will come straight through to me. And I will put your question uh, to our interviewee at the end of this session. So on that subject, let me introduce my interviewee for today. So Peter Luli is, um, is very involved in electronic invoicing. As you can see from the information on your slide now, he's a senior director of financial solutions for the Ariba network. And many of you who are looking at the invoicing will be very familiar with Ariba. And for those of you who are starting to look at e-invoicing, I can pretty much vouch that Ariba will absolutely be one of the, the top top uh, three, top five solutions that you look at. It's, 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 it's pretty much always there on every tender that I hear of. So um, make a big note of, of ensuring that you make contact with Ariba after this as one key takeaway. So Peter Lilly, Senior Director of Financial Solutions for the Ariba Network. Um, prior to joining Ariba in 2009, he was uh, a Vice President um, for a supply chain finance solution provider. Um, incidentally, in, two, in 2000, he was part of the founding team at Quadrum. And Quadrum has um, had a lot of press recently, um, and in particular because it is a, um, a, a company that's been acquired by Ariba. It was acquired by Ariba in 2010. Uh, Peter, by trade, is a lawyer. And um, uh, he was named as Pro to Know 
in 2010 by Supply and Demand Chain Executive Magazine. So, hello, Peter. Great to have you on this webinar. Thank you so much, Susie. Pleasure to be here. Good. Thank you. Look, um, before we move into just understanding a little bit of, of where we are um, in your opinion, I just want to get a read, please, from everybody on this webinar. Um, a poll question coming up, the first out of eight. Just wanting to understand where you are in your e-invoicing project. So tick the box, which is most appropriate to you. What stage are you at in e-invoicing? We are fully rolled out with electronic invoicing. Uh, we are in project, but we do have indeed a, a way to go. We are just about to sign with a provider or just about to go live. We are evaluating the market with the intention to go live 2012, 2013. Or perhaps you are new to e-invoicing and just on this webinar because you are curious. So please tick the box most appropriate to you. We always look to get about 70% of you voting. We're only at 58%. Um, so please do tick the box most appropriate to your own situation. What stage are you at in e-invoicing? I'll be closing the poll. In three, two, one. We were at 68% there. So let's see if we can get those figures up, please. This is indeed a benchmarking um, session uh, as well. So please, I am looking for as many of you to contribute as possible. So let's just have a look at those statistics made available there. So um, interesting dynamic, not quite a bell curve, if any, anything, the opposite. With 23% um, uh, of you fully rolled out and, and at the other end of the spectrum, 33% are a new to invoicing and um, are on, on this because they're curious. Okay, good. So let me turn it over to you, Peter, with my first question, which is really just for the benefit of everyone on this webinar, how would you choose to define electronic invoicing? Um, Susie, first of all, just to, to comment on the poll, I think it's a great result and frankly indicative of where probably the market generally is with respect to who's evaluating and, and curious about the uh, dynamic. But um, it, with respect to the definition of the invoicing, obviously defining anything is, is often the first step in understanding it. And um, uh, defining e-invoicing specifically can be an exercise fraught with peril because in a relatively new environment there may be different approaches or different takes to what uh, the it is. Um, I, I compare defining invoicing a little bit to uh, a bunch of uh, people uh, uh, who are blind who are trying to describe what an elephant is. It depends where you are and what you're describing. But uh, uh, with respect to uh, a lawyer's take, perhaps, to uh, a definition on e-invoicing, uh, I, I would argue looking at it from the buyer's perspective, because typically e-invoicing programs are rolled out from a buyer uh, perspective if you're looking at it within a buyer-to-supplier relationship. Uh, I would I would uh, uh, posit that e-invoicing is a process that enables a company to securely and reliably receive a machine-readable claim for payment for goods or services that uh, come from the suppliers, uh, and that enhance the speed and efficiency of a decision to pay for those goods or services uh, demonstrably re rendered by that supplier. And additionally, I would I would given the nature of the invoice itself, I would add that it needs to meet internal procurement, financial, or technical requirements and must comply with external requirements that relate to tax, legal, or other requirements. I think central to this um, with respect to the invoice is that the invoice in the B2B discussion or the business-to-business -business discussion that is entailed between buyers and suppliers is a document uh, unlike any other. Uh, it, it, it attracts the scrutiny not only of the shared services organizations that may be participating in today's call or AP or AR. Uh, professionals, but speaks to everyone from finance, treasury, procurement, as well as the external environment of uh, regulators and governments, etc. So uh, critical for those who are exploring e-invoicing uh, to understand what the invoice document is, and we'll talk about that probably later in the, in, in the call today, uh, but I would, I would posit this as sort of a, um, uh, a, a fundamental discussion of what e-invoicing is, and in, in looking to roll out an e-invoicing program or solution, you need to understand uh, the entirety of the element that, uh, that e-invoicing is. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Um, so I, we want to come on to, I want to come on and ask you about how you would describe the current e-invoicing market in terms of adoption, so we can talk a little bit about current state. But before I do do that, I just want to um, ask the audience what their 
perception is of levels of adoption, uh, specifically looking at the European market today. So on your screens, ladies and gentlemen, looking at Europe, out of the 30 billion invoices uh, traded each year in Europe, what percentage do you think are in a format suitable for automatic processing, i.e. Um, no paper has ever been um, created or printed on at any stage? Uh, they are an electronic format. So is it 1 to 10 percent, 11 to 20 percent, 21 to 40 percent, 41 to 60 percent, or over 60 percent? So this is pertaining to the whole of Europe as a region rather than specific countries within Europe. So 66% of you have voted, 67. Uh, please, if you haven't voted, please do so. Again, this is very valuable benchmarking information and we do always share the results live. So 69% of you have voted. Closing the poll in three, two, one. Let's have a look at the results. We were on 73% there, so thank you for that. Interesting results coming up on your screen now. Um, and I will pass back over to Peter for a review of this uh, these results. Thank you, Susie. And uh, that, the, if I look at the results, it appears that uh, roughly half believe there's less than uh, 20 to 30 percent of uh, invoices that are in a format suitable for automatic processing. And um, that would be closer to the mark, I think. Um, and uh, perhaps those in the lighter uh, uh, quintiles are, are looking ahead. And, and that's, uh, that's always good with respect to broader adoption. Um, those who, who have tracked this, and particularly with respect to um, uh, data in Europe, uh, the uh, European Commission's Digital Agenda Scoreboard does track um, a variety of um, uh, digital activity within the um, uh, EC countries. And their take on the number of percentages of enterprises sending or receiving e-invoices in a format suitable for automatic processing um, uh, run the gamut here. And I think uh, folks can read on the screen what that is. The average is about 30% uh, within the uh, within the EC. Uh, at the left-hand quadrant, it appears that uh, countries like Italy, Lithuania, and Norway uh, are those that are furthest ahead with respect to the ability to send or receive the invoices. And at the other extreme, you have um, uh, jurisdictions like Turkey, Slovenia, Cyprus, Hungary. I think notably, uh, in some of the larger economies, uh, the UK is uh, currently at a 12%. Um, the deployment uh, or, or automatic data or automatic process, uh, processing capability. Uh, Germany is at about uh, 35, uh, and you see other uh, jurisdictions, certainly Scandinavian uh, uh, jurisdictions, driven largely, frankly, by uh, government initiatives with respect to um, electronic invoicing, uh, are on the left-hand side of the average line there. But I think this is a very uh, telling um, uh, number. I think I think too that uh, what, what's also interesting to track is what's happened over the past few years and what are the trends. This is the snapshot, but what are the trends? Um, unfortunately, the, um, uh, the uh, EC hasn't gone back to, say, 2000 to see how these have trended, but I think they, they do have the numbers of the last uh, three years. And I think this is actually quite telling. I think that um, uh, the, the general assumption, uh, say, for example, in the UK has been that um, only 10% of, of invoices have been uh, sent and received electronically. Uh, it, it, it appears that in several jurisdictions, and we simply selected a basket of uh, jurisdictions here, it looks like uh, clearly there's an uptrend to, um, to invoicing, uh, e-invoicing adoption, and the ability to electronically send or receive e-invoices. And, and in particular, you see jurisdictions like um, uh, Italy, um, uh, France, and Germany really uh, picking up. In fact, uh, notably, France has moved from a a 20% uh, adoption rate in 2008 to uh, roughly a 38% uh, or almost doubling of uh, that percentage. And uh, there, there are reasons for that, which, um, which I expect we'll get into in the, in, in the call later today. But I think the message here is that um, the adoption varies widely, tends to be jurisdictionally focused, uh, but no question that the trend is, uh, is upward with respect to broader uh, deployment of uh, invoicing solutions. And, and you did mention on that that jurisdiction by jurisdiction, it, there is there is some um, some variation, and some uh, countries have got their um, kind of got going with electronic invoicing in a in a much more um, proactive way. If you were going to look at kind of certain countries or certain uh, kind of sub regions within within Europe, um, what what do you attribute 
that pro proactivity to? You know, I think uh, the, the number of reasons. I think one of them, uh, very simply, may be that of a government fiat, um, a regulatory change or, or legislation that compels um, the movement away from, say, paper-based invoices to electronic invoices. And if you look recently at jurisdictions, uh, jurisdictions like Denmark, Singapore, Sweden, Italy, Finland, uh, Greece, um, uh, Norway, within government procurement, um, uh, policies have been in place or are, 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 are timetabled to be in place whereby uh, invoicing shall be electronic. So if you're doing business with government agencies within those jurisdictions, um, the only way you will be able to do business and render an invoice is if you do it through um, an electronic invoice solution. Um, other jurisdictions that are uh, contemplating that or have plans in place include Canada, Luxembourg, um, Russia, Mexico, and, and, uh, and Brazil. Uh, I know too, in fact, I think just the other day that the government of Kazakhstan announced that uh, invoicing would be um, electronic. So that's, that's certainly one of the, um, uh, the reasons why that is. And if you think about why that is, uh, if you, to, uh, as to why governments are interested in the invoice in particular, there was uh, a great practitioner in the space uh, of e-invoicing generally is Christian van der Valk, who's the CEO at uh, Trustweaver, and uh, uh, works with companies to understand how they can ensure that invoicing initiatives are, are fully compliant uh, to jurisdictions in which they seek to deploy them. And uh, he did a brilliant um, analysis of various business statements, documents, or transactions that can happen between a buyer and a supplier. Um, looked at things like a purchase order, or a bank statement, or, or even just a, a physical contract that can exist between trading partners. And then looked at the invoice and asked, you know, what are the commercial aspects of greatest interest in those documents uh, that, are, that are of greatest interest to regulatory authorities. And, and if you look at what uh, governments or regulatories are interested in, they want to know who are the parties, what's the nature of the good or the service, what's the price, was the price actually paid, is the tax correctly calculated, was the supply performed. And, and, and as you run through these various indicia of what's of interest to the government, the invoice is the thing uh, from which uh, all of that wonderful information exists and, and flows between parties and it and varies on a transaction by transaction basis. So um, that's one of the drivers uh, to why governments uh, in particular are focusing on the invoice and um, wrapping a regulatory framework around that and getting their arms around that, particularly in the era in which we're in today where governments are, um, as we're all reading the headlines, are focusing more on uh, revenue flows internally. Uh, to meet um, various um, uh, debt ratios, et cetera, that uh, uh, speak to um, uh, their requirements with respect to the broader financial situation that we find ourselves in. Okay. Um, that takes us quite nicely to talking about the future and the future direction of e-invoicing. Um, so, and I know, Peter, that you've got a kind of a, an analogy that you, you, you use, and I just want you to draw on that for a moment, if you will, within, whilst answering this question. But I, I would like you generally, please, to, to um, consider the following question, which is, um, based on where we are today, um, where do you believe, or how do you believe adoption levels will change within the next five years or so? And do you when do you think that kind of the tipping point of e-invoicing will actually occur? A great question, and, and, and in fact, I love the use of the term tipping point because if we think of Internet-enabled services and technologies and all of that, we, we tend to think of companies like uh, Groupon or Facebook or LinkedIn or Google or anything of that nature, and a tipping point would refer to um, uh, it's, it's a term that Malcolm Gladwell uh, defined, which is the uh, uh, the moment of critical mass or the threshold, of, with, or like a boiling point, and that uh, ideas and products um, uh, spread like uh, like viruses. Um, the, I, I, with respect to Mr. Gladwell, I don't think that that the concept of a tipping point actually um, uh, applies to B two B commerce or e commerce, and, and specifically uh, e invoicing is uh, is the topic today. In fact, one of my colleagues once wrote that the only thing that spreads like viruses among large enterprises are well, computer viruses, <laughs> which are precisely the wrong type of virus you want to spread. So I I actually think the better analogy about the future is is that of um, uh, of, a, of a flywheel, and and how um, and this was a concept that. Um, was um, was written by Jim Collins in a book called Good to Great, in which 
things will take time, and that a flywheel uh, is, is the better analogy for change uh, as we uh, look to, um, to move something that's very hard, and it takes a lot of time, so the general pace of progress will be uh, more timely. As far as we, we look to compare e-invoicing today uh, to, to another uh, uh, experience that we have in our daily lives, I like to use the, the analogy of uh, the boarding pass, an airline boarding pass. And what the boarding pass itself tells us about the service we're about to undertake in, in, in the airline industry. So here in this slide, we, we have an individual who was issued a handwritten boarding pass by an airline which, uh, whose identity has been um, uh, grayed out here. Uh, but this, uh, I can assure you this is actually a boarding pass issued in 2007 um, for an airline that shall not be named. Now, if you're the recipient of, of a paper-based, handwritten boarding pass, what is likely to be your expectation that the pilots are of full confidence and ready to fly the aircraft, that the, that the aircraft has been properly maintained using, using state-of-the-art processes and technologies to maintain aircraft, and, and frankly, that the aircraft itself uh, is, is something that's uh, relatively new and not a, um, a gas-guzzling DC-8 from the 1970s. Um, on the other hand, if you, if you receive a boarding pass that you can, you can um, uh, obtain online or even through your smartphone PDA, and we're beginning to see these now where your smartphone can actually act as a boarding pass, aren't you likely to think that if the technology that's in my hand right now and the most customer-facing um, uh, experience you can have at an airline, I'm, I'm likely to believe that I've got confident personnel flying the aircraft, that I've got, uh, that the aircraft's properly maintained, and they probably have a, a relatively modern fleet. I don't know about you, but I would much rather know that I've got the boarding pass that uh, is the sort of state of the art and is the latest version of the boarding pass. And I certainly don't want yesterday's technology. So I think in talking about the future, we need to look at what the state of the art is today and what's available today. And, and what we as, uh, uh, as, as, as organizers of, of, of corporate uh, policies with respect to things, even like e-invoicing, um, uh, are, are, are facing and what our e-invoicing plan, solution, or strategy tells us about ourselves, and, and also with respect to the suppliers that we're dealing with if we're the suppliers. So think about that a bit, because I think we're, we're actually at the point, and we've seen the data uh, with respect to the uh, European Commission and, and, and the growth in rates. We're seeing how governments are beginning to mandate e-invoicing. Um, and we're beginning to see, too, that the broader economic environment is sort of forcing us to look at how we control um, cash and how we manage our business-to-business uh, -business interactions. Ask yourself what a heavily burdensome paper-based system tells us about the state of general progress of our own company. And if I'm a supplier, and I'll use and I'll end this analogy on this note, if I'm a supplier, and I've been a, before being involved in B2B e-commerce, I was working with a global mining company as a supplier to a global mining company. And I can tell you that if I, as a supplier, know that it takes a great deal of time and that it, a process simply to submit an invoice is burdensome, complex, difficult, and if I know that based on my experience with that, with that customer, that, I, that the likelihood of getting paid on time accurately is, is, is not going to be there, then I'm going to price that into my good or service. And I think anybody that's in the AP side of the house, or particularly if they're dealing with the procurement side, will know that that's the case, that suppliers will price complexity and, and difficulty of payment into their good or service. Uh, as well, if I'm a supplier where I know that my buyer has got state-of-the-art invoicing solutions or methods of doing business with me such that I have a high degree of confidence that I will be paid on time accurately, or even as some companies are contemplating today, maybe be even be able to advance payment uh, by way of either early permanent discount or supply chain finance. That's a customer I want to do business with and ensure that uh, I don't uh, jeopardize, particularly in, in, in today's economy. So I think the boarding pass analogy is a good one to sort of think about as you look at your own companies to say, where are we on that continuum and what do we need to be to be perceived internally and within our supply chain as um, uh, being up to snuff on this stuff. So you talked, um, obviously, you, you, you were talking, we were talking there about the tipping point, and maybe that it's a terminology that does kind of pertain more to um, kind of um, uh, consumer networks, if you will, rather than um, maybe specifically kind of B2B networks as such. I just wonder, though, as well, from a consumer perspective, uh, we are getting very used to advanced technology. 
and um, uh, and and our expectations of what technology can do is is um, maturing a lot. It's much more advanced than it was, say, you know, back in 2007. Um, to what degree, Peter, do you think that is having an impact on how um, corporations and teams are looking at e-invoicing? Do you think it do you think it makes um, corporates a kind of a, um, a slightly more challenging um, group to, to sell sell electronic to, to electronic invoicing to? Do you think they are changing their requirements? How do you think its impact their buying process? I think it has a huge impact. I think that. And, and frankly, I think it should have a huge impact in the, in, along two lines. First of all, I do think that our ability as consumers, whether it's an Amazon or an eBay or a Facebook, to simply go to a site, uh, read through what invariably is a 78-page online document you scroll through and say, I accept, and, and then be in business as a consumer of that good or service is coloring our attitude and our perspectives with respect to more complex business-to-business uh, -business undertakings. Now. Um, I, I think that uh, real life business to business is complex, and the business or sorry the consumer um, uh, expectation does not easily fit into that um, uh, sort of b two b environment. That being said, I think it's incumbent on practitioners in the space, uh, service providers such as Ariba and others, to more closely align themselves and make easier. Uh, and more consumer-like the experience of engaging with uh, other companies. And we at Ariba, in fact, we, we, we refer to it as consumerizing business commerce, and we, we constantly look at ways in which we can uh, mimic the experience of uh, you, know, you or me sitting in front of our, our laptops uh, uh, engaging in commerce. We're looking at ways all the time to simplify and make that uh, uh, more streamlined. So I think Number one, yes, uh, uh, our perspectives and our expectations are coloring uh, our, our, uh, our procurement of solutions that can uh, mimic that in our e-invoicing uh, challenges and, and uh, objectives. And I think, too, that we uh, providers and practitioners in space, it's incumbent upon us to more closely mimic that. I think the other, the other point I want to add to this is there's a generational thing that's happening as well. I think that as our, our, our children and the students emerge from uh, uh, higher uh, colleges of higher education and have their experiences with email, internet, Facebook, whatever the case may be, uh, they will be entering the workforce with an expectation that, that um, old ways of doing things just don't, uh, don't cut it. Very personally, my, my son is at a, at a college where he's studying a computer science course right now. Um, and he's uh, uh, regaling me with tales of classes and modules and JavaScript and the like. And I uh, 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 turned to him and I said, well, are, uh, what about EDI? Are you, what are you guys learning about EDI? And he looked at me and said, what, what's EDI? Uh, so I think, I think it's a very telling sign that as we are entering this phase of, of rapid technological change, that it's not only incumbent on us to look at how we modernize our solutions, but we make sure that we're not missing the boat with respect to what uh, inexorably is happening as companies look to digitize these business conversations. Okay, good. Thank you, Peter. So um, I actually just I want to ask our third poll coming up now, please, ladies and gentlemen. So if you can take the box appropriate to your own situation. This is looking, we've been talking about a, a change, a change in um, adoption of technology. So looking at your own level of adoption with electronic invoicing within your own company today, do you believe um, that the adoption is very good? We are ahead of where we would like to be or where we looked to be. It's good. We are bang on target. It's fair. We thought we would be a little further along than we actually are. Poor. We are behind the curve with good reason, though. Or is it poor? We are behind the curve with no good reason. Please be frank here. Only 42% of you have responded to this question. It again, I cannot urge, cannot um, urge the point enough. This is a benchmarking opportunity for you to be finding out how you um, sit, as it were, within, within the market. We do have well over 100 uh, corporations on, on this webinar today, so it's a good benchmarking opportunity. So please uh, do share with us where you think your level of adoption is. Um, closing the poll in three, two, one. Let's have a look at the results coming up. We have 59% of you responding there. So coming up now on your Green. Um, Nine percent of you say that you're you're very comfortable with where you are. You're ahead of 
of uh, where you look to be. 25% of you bang on target, 41% fair, and 18% uh, of you poor, uh, but with good reason. And uh, thank you very much for the 7% of you that said that you were poor and with no good reason. I'd like to pass um, back to you, um, Peter, with any comment on that, please. Sure. Well, uh, first of all, to all of you that are uh, practitioners, in, uh, practitioners in the space and deploying an e-invoicing uh, initiative, congratulations for um, for the results you have achieved and uh, uh, continue on in, in the exercise. Um, I, I think one of the important things to note is that uh, enabling business-to-business -business, uh, commerce is hard. Uh, it, it is hard work. And uh, those of you who are practitioners will know exactly what I mean there. It's uh, uh, it's come a long way. We're not in the uh, very beginning of, uh, uh, you know, we're not in chapter one of the book. Uh, we're, we're some ways down uh, the road of it, and there have been uh, incredible advances in the last 10 years even in enabling uh, business commerce and, and technology, and in particular, uh, the ability to uh, walk a mile that's been built for you with predecessors who have deployed uh, solutions of technology, and in particular, the ability to tap into pre-existing networks of enabled uh, digitally enabled suppliers. For example, in the Ariba network, um, uh, we have uh, upwards of 600,000 companies that um, are on our network that have uh, the capability of transacting with companies today. And so uh, we're, we're not back in 1999, 2000, where these uh, pre-existing uh, enabled networked communities were available for you to, to, get, a, uh, to get a head start and, and going. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's still not uh, work to do for the reasons I alluded at the, out, at the outset. Uh, E-invoicing is necessarily uh, something that uh, touches many um, aspects internally, um, uh, externally too with uh, jurisdictional requirements, et cetera, be it uh, you know, uh, uh, digital signatures or, or uh, archiving or auditing and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so it's hard work, and congratulations to those of you who've hit the target and, and uh, keep going for those of you that... Um, uh, that are looking to achieve your targets, uh, the, the end result is uh, certainly very worthwhile. Okay, good. Um, I'm actually just going to follow on uh, with a, another poll coming up now. Um, so just really wanting to get a little bit more of an understanding as to perhaps what is needed um, in order to accelerate adoption um, within an organization as far as e-invoicing is concerned. So uh, coming up on your screen now, you can see the, the, the poll question. Uh, what needs to happen internally for your company to accelerate its e-invoicing adoption? Um, will you need to perhaps streamline your ERP first or consolidate your ERPs first? Maybe finance and procurement. This is multiple responses, ladies and gentlemen. So do take the boxes, um, which all the boxes that apply to you. Finance and procurement need to be much more aligned than they are today to get e-invoicing moving. Um, suppliers perhaps need to understand the benefits more. And uh, you have the option there of, of we need to drive our first time match rate up before we can move to electronic. Um, or perhaps you need to implement shared services first. You need to centralize your receipt of invoices first. Um, so. A low percentage of you have responded. Again, we're only at about 40% of you, so please uh, do tick all the boxes that are appropriate to you. Um, I do realize that some of you are, are happy with where you are at, so this question does only apply to um, those of you on the webinar who um, feel that there does need to be something that causes more acceleration. So um, closing the poll in three, two, one. Coming up on your screen are the results. Uh, we're just 49% of you responded to that. So um, we have as kind of clear winners here that perhaps what I can term as um, ob object objections to getting on with e-invoicing um, is the lack of alignment between finance and procurement, and uh, that suppliers just aren't really understanding the the, the business benefits to them. So. Um, Peter, your comments on, on both of those points, if, if I can. I, 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 I'm uh, chuckling a little bit uh, to see that, um, uh, for once, uh, uh, technical integration and ERP issues do not lead the four of, uh, of challenges. And, and frankly, I think that's exactly right. I think this would be very representative of, of things generally. Um, uh, technology has its challenges, but uh, frankly, it's the relatively easier part. 
um, what with connectivity to systems and capabilities and people understand this stuff, uh, getting your ERP system to talk to a network in order to uh, enable the exchange of uh, invoice, uh, invoice with your suppliers is relatively straightforward, not without its challenges, of course, uh, but relatively straightforward. I think uh, your, uh, the audience today has nailed uh, what I would argue are the, 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 the bigger challenges uh, that typically show up um, in, in uh, uh, deployments today, and that is aligning internal stakeholders, be that finance, procurement, and, and increasingly uh, by finance I would include in that uh, treasury, AP, uh, shared service if that's uh, part of what the organization's about and ensuring that everybody is singing from the same song sheet with respect to the e-invoicing initiative. So no surprise there. I think on the supplier side as well, um, the, uh, the ability to uh, communicate to the suppliers why you are doing this, what the benefits are to them, uh, and particularly how the, that's going to impact their changes is also typically the, the challenge. Um, uh, there are answers to both. Um, and we work with customers very closely to ensure uh, that various stakeholders that need to be involved with an e-invoicing initiative uh, understand what the benefits are, are uh, and how they dovetail with perhaps their own uh, initiatives. For example, uh, Treasury may have, uh, in, in dealing with their bank partners, uh, a desire to roll out a supply chain finance initiative, um, and they may, they may themselves uh, operate uh, in a little bit of a silo and not bring uh, procurement or AP or IT into that discussion as they need to. And so you run a little bit of that um, uh, challenge and obstacle as well. But clearly, to be successful, you need to be aligned. Uh, and the, uh, the ability to reach out to suppliers and, and have them understand the benefits is absolutely key as well. OK, good. Um, and also, I'm just very curious to know what needs to happen externally for, um, for, for companies that are dialed into this webinar to um, accelerate their e-invoicing program. So again, coming up, and multiple, multiple answers here as well, please. What needs to happen externally for your company to accelerate its e-invoicing adoption? So externally, please. And you've got the, the, the options there. Uh, governments need to get behind this much more. Tax and VAT requirements need to be much simpler. Um, we are seeking format standards first. Um, we need to improve our business case, and this is not really pertaining to internal influences, but more um, the, what's included within e-invoicing, the functionality of e-invoicing. Um, I am waiting for my bank to offer a solution before I get going on this. Again, uh, only 25% of you have, have responded. Um, so we're pretty much looking about the same levels that responded to the previous poll, so in the region of um, uh, about 40, 40 plus percent. Uh, so just to repeat the question, and this is a multiple answer, please do take the box um, of all the responses that apply to you. What needs to happen externally for your company to accelerate its e-invoicing adoption? What would make it easier for you to get going and get further um, along the curve with e-invoicing? So, uh, closing the poll, ladies and gentlemen, in three, two, one, we're at 51 percent there. Let's have a look at the answers coming up on your screen very shortly. So um, you can see here um, that we have uh, 54 percent of responses uh, are waiting for tax and VAT requirements to be simpler, um, and then down the scale. 3% uh, I'm waiting for my a bank to be um, offering a solution. Um, again, your response to the, the, um, the results there, please, Peter. Uh, you know, uh, a little bit all over the board. The clarity it seems to be that uh, companies are not looking uh, for the bank to lead them uh, to the value opportunity here. And I think that's, that's about right. I think um, in order for the company to move forward or accelerate its invoicing adoption, it needs to start first with the question of what is this going to do to make my company stronger, more resilient, better able to deal with the uncertainty down the road, uh, and in particular, how is it going to help my suppliers uh, meet my supply chain requirements? I think that um, some of the external uh, factors driving this, of course, are going to be the regulatory environment that I think uh, people need to um, uh, to uh, obviously be, be mindful of. I think the one that does lead the pack around tax and VAT requirements, um, I, I don't know necessarily whether being simpler would need to have happened, but certainly be clearer. I think 
companies are perfectly able to deal with the conditions uh, in which they do business so long as um, uh, clarity emerges with respect to what the rules of the game are. And I think one of the challenges uh, with companies today is uh, they don't know necessarily what's going to be coming down the pike uh, from, uh, from governments, be it with respect to consumption taxes like VAT or even broader uh, corporate taxes that um, probably engender a whole other discussion around this. Uh, separately with respect to uh, just the general environment in which companies do uh, business. Okay, good. So uh, I, I do actually want to talk about um, the role of banks uh, within the future of re-invoicing. Um, it is something that we're hearing as an observer to this market, we're hearing much more. Um, what's your view of the role of banks within the e-invoicing space? Uh, that's a great question, and it's also something that um, uh, is, uh, is is being written as we speak. I think if you look at what's happened in banking over the last three years, no one would have imagined in, uh, say, 2006 that the banking industry would be turned topsy-turvy inside out and backwards, um, and we're, we're undergoing a, an incredible change with respect to just generally how even sovereign debt is is monitored, tracked, et cetera, but this has had a profound impact on, on banks and banking generally. Uh, with respect to where banks see themselves playing in, in the world of, of and how it impacts e-invoicing, I think that banks uh, clearly are looking to focus uh, their attention on uh, those areas where they can um, achieve um, a, a solid revenue stream themselves as a business. And so their focus has tended to be on larger uh, investment grade corporates in which risk, uh, which is the uh, the core of what banking's measure do and earn a, tr earn a return on, is, is defined and can be planned to. So as banks look and plan out their own futures and where the opportunities are, they will tend to focus uh, and, and have focused greatly in areas of, say, trade finance, particularly as emerging, emerging economies have, have grown and where there's been some demand, and the ability to support corporates in meeting the opportunities there. How that relates to e-invoicing is that banks increasingly have felt uh, the ability not only to offer pure financial products such as, say, letters of credit or export-import financing for suppliers or th those kinds of things that fall within the bailiwick of trade finance writ large, but are beginning to realize that it's important for them, too, to offer an e-invoicing solution uh, that can act as somewhat of the foundation of that trade finance uh, piece. Um, so if you, you were to think of a Venn diagram, say, of, of banks and, and uh, uh, banking uh, providers offering their services uh, to the market generally, and you think of service providers like Ariba's and networks like ours that offer supply chain connectivity solutions, if you thought of that as a Venn diagram, you would see those two circles getting closer together and even potentially intersecting uh, with respect to the provisioning of what each does as banks start to sound a little bit more like the Ariba's of the world and uh, Ariba in offering things, be it supply chain finance or early payment discount solutions or P-card connectivity, et cetera, are sounding a little bit more of what you would expect from a bank. I would expect that trend to continue longer term. And I think for those on the call who are uh, either shopping for solutions or looking to source solutions or even looking to add to solutions that are on there today, uh, keep in mind that um, uh, that area may, uh, may start to be a little bit grayer as to who offers what. And also, uh, you know, for those that are on the call, they come from the treasury function, you're likely to uh, hear more of these overtures from banks. And for those of you who are not in the treasury function, uh, it may be a, a, a good thing to reach out to your treasury colleague in, in, in the guise of uh, breaking down some of those corporate silos and asking uh, whether uh, they're entertaining any uh, you know, e-invoicing initiative that may be bank-driven uh, as opposed to where you would traditionally find these things. And that, this takes us on to another poll question, please. So um, again, coming up from your screen now. Um, so as far as um, your assessment or your observation of, of your own bank um, offering e-invoicing as a, a service to you, um, how, how much do you agree with uh, the following statement? I'm, I'm noticing that my bank or, or financial institutions that I've worked with are increasing their sales efforts relating to supply chain solutions. Do you very strongly agree with that? Moderately agree with that? Neither agree, agree nor disagree? Moderately disagree or perhaps you very strongly disagree? So please do tick the box um, most appropriate to 
your own situation. So it could be that they are direct, um, contacting you directly or perhaps they are contacting your organization um, through their, um, their kind of more traditional contact, maybe through Treasury. So are they reaching out to you more, looking to serve service you with a, their e-invoicing solution? So closing the poll, ladies and gentlemen, in three, two, one. Uh, we were at about 56% of you responding there. Um, so 11% of you say that you do actually agree with that statement and uh, you are having contact made and 34% and of you moderately agree. Um, so that's about 45% of you, um, if it's fair to say, proactively being contacted there. Um, I'd just like to um, to ask you, Peter, specifically again, coming, coming back to banks. So um, supply chain financing is now um, a, a big focus area for a, a lot of organizations um, and I'd actually, there are a number of questions I'd like to ask you specifically around that area. Um, we, we are still in a, an uncomfortable economic climate right now, um, probably when uh, organizations were uh, signing up to e-invoicing solutions maybe five years ago, the central driver was maybe transaction cost reduction. How, how do you feel that um, our economic climate is impacting our, our choices um, for e-invoicing? Uh, goodness, uh, the, the economic climate is driven principally by today uncertainty and, and, and uh, uh, not being very comfortable with what lies around the bend uh, with respect to the economy generally uh, and, and just generally where, where the, the next revenue gain or growth is going to come from. And so companies, uh, in, in the face of that uncertainty, uh, driven largely by anemic consumer demand, are hedging um, risk by by putting cash aside and uh, you know leveraging or uh, growing their balance sheet. So uh, typically, you're seeing very large companies hoarding cash as as the ultimate uh, protector against uh, the uncertainty that they're facing. Um, as far as the uh, the impact uh, to to companies moving forward, what they're also doing is uh, trying to reduce the risk that exists on their revenue streams and ensuring that their supply chains are uh, vibrant enough to support them in, in making the goods or producing the services that they're offering to the general market. I'll use an example in, in illustrating this. Caterpillar, for example, uh, uh, this time last year indicated that they'd missed uh, certain numbers by virtue of uh, their supply chain um, not being able to uh, source uh, goods or services or components to uh, end uh, materials that they were shipping out to overseas markets. And what they found was that their supply chain had effectively shut down after 2009 and, and not been able to ramp up quickly because they couldn't uh, get access to funds to uh, initiate new product lines or invest in their own plants and equipment, et cetera, to meet Caterpillar's new demand. So this was a bit of an aha for Caterpillar, and what they've done as a result is uh, they've not only deployed an e-invoicing solution um, that, uh, that they're looking to roll out worldwide and make 100% compliant with their suppliers, uh, but they're also uh, layering on top of that uh, the ability to leverage uh, Caterpillar's own investment-grade access to funds to the benefit of their suppliers in, in a supply chain finance program that they're making available to key suppliers. I think this is really where you start to look at what some of the potential is for an e-invoicing solution, and that it, it really lays the foundation and the, fa and, and the framework in which to realize new gains for the corporate. If you're able to reduce your approval time on that invoice from, say, on average 25 or 30 days today, which is the typical uh, general approval time for an invoice, and you're able to reduce that, say, to four or five days, then there's all sorts of opportunities for you as a, as a corporate uh, to to uh, to do, to earn new value for yourself, your shareholders, etc., and to deliver value to your suppliers. So think of this as e-invoicing as a foundation uh, to your business, but also uh, uh, being able to offer cash up early on demand to suppliers through an early payment discount program or some other supply chain finance offering, uh, as well as to earn a better return on your cash that's sitting on your balance sheet uh, than than simply uh, the paltry returns that you can either get in the equity markets or the bond markets today. So um, at the end of the day, an invoicing solution is not just an opportunity to reduce the typical dollar per cost or the dollar cost per invoice process, but it, it op offers uh, a tremendous opportunity to strengthen your supply chain, reduce supply chain risk, and earn a return 
on, on idle cash if that's uh, the objective you're seeking uh, as well. Okay, let's throw this question out to the audience, please. So again, coming up on your screen, ladies and gentlemen, this is poll number seven out of eight polls. Um, how important is it that your service provider, your e-invoicing service provider, can offer supply chain financing uh, to your suppliers? Is it it's central to your requirements? Is important but not the key driver? It's uh, not important or perhaps you're not so sure today. Hopefully, if you're not so sure today, you'll have a much clearer view um, after this interview with Peter. So. Um, please do respond. Uh, we're on about 25% of you responding. Um, so I will be closing the poll very, very shortly. Uh, so just one final um, review of that question. How important is it that your service provider, your e-invoicing service provider, can offer supply chain financing to your suppliers? Uh, closing the poll in three, two, one. Let's have a look. Coming up on the, uh, the screen now, so you've got 3% uh, um, of you saying absolutely central to your requirements, 31% important, uh, but not necessarily the key driver today. Um, Peter, what's your view of those responses? I, I think very typical. I think that uh, supply chain finance as a concept uh, is something that's not brand new, but certainly relatively new. Um, and so it's not surprising that, uh, say, some folks believe it's not central to their requirements. I think it, it's actually quite telling that it's um, that it's got the the response rate that it has one in three saying it's important but not the key driver. Um, there there's also an element here that you can really only truly think about supply chain finance for your suppliers and for your own for your own corporate benefit uh, if you have the invoice automation piece in place first. Um, in, in the previous life, I've been involved with deploying supply chain finance programs. And uh, I can tell you that there have been some surprises sometimes when you deploy a supply chain finance program only to discover that the corporate ability to approve the invoice simply wasn't uh, fast enough, simply wasn't there. You cannot deploy any supply chain finance program uh, if it takes you 50 days to approve an invoice. Um, so, so the very first step uh, in any successful supply chain finance program, of course, is getting that invoice approval time as close to zero as uh, as possible in order to provide the, the opportunity for yourself and your supplier uh, for that arbitrage opportunity to take place as far as the financing opportunity is concerned. So not surprising. Um, I think it's actually telling that it's got, got the uh, uh, the penetration or the response rate that it has uh, right here as well. So it, it sounds like much of your audience are fully up to speed with it and, and exploring it, which is a great thing. Okay. Um, with with the um, the pressure that that all organisations are are feeling um, or at the moment, which is about making sure that capital is being used in the most uh, financially beneficial way, and and obviously recognising that um, in order to to service customers, we must make sure that our suppliers are very much in business. So the supply chain financing aspect of um, e-invoicing will inevitably um, increase. Um, surely the one route that um, an e-invoicing provider could go down is to, um, to maybe also not just provide the kind of functionality and the speed with which invoices can be processed, but also the liquidity to their customers um, to, to kind of offer the entire solution. So not necessarily an e-invoicing provider having to partner with a bank in order to offer the perfect supply chain financing solution. Do you kind of potentially see a new breed of e-invoicing provider perhaps coming to um, perhaps coming forward within the next few months, few years? What, what's your view on that? I, I think this is a very dynamic space right now and I think that you're quite right. Um, you know, we, we talk to customers all the time about precisely what you're saying is the case. Whether it's my bank, whether it's a non-bank provider, I'd like to go to one place where I can get it all. Uh, any supply chain practitioner will know that, gosh, hooking myself up to my suppliers is a Herculean effort. I'm looking to hook up my suppliers and myself and, and a financial institution or several to support a supply chain finance program. Gosh, it would be nice to go one place to get that. I, I would say simply to uh, those, those uh, individuals, yes, I think that that uh, is uh, something that is a very dynamic uh, story that's being written now. Uh, and that uh, we can expect that, uh, be it from banks or non-bank providers, they can expect to get um, as the market matures and, and evolves, a sort of a one-stop shop on that kind of stuff. And uh, 
um, uh, I, I would say simply, uh, you know, that uh, you watch this space uh, more or less. That's uh, that's the uh, that's sort of the evolution of the space generally. Okay, good. Um, you'll see from the slides that are on your screen, ladies and gentlemen, that we've we've touched on a lot of these elements. Um, there is, as well, the subject of interoperability between networks. Um, so uh, I'd be interested to know, Peter, what your view on interoperability is. Um, currently, but also with the future in mind of, of interoperability between service providers. Yeah, and actually, this, this echoes a little bit of the conversation we had earlier about expectations and what we have as consumers of information in our Facebook or Google or LinkedIn or whatever other accounts that we have and, and what we have uh, in, in our uh, expectation with respect to interoperability. And, and the, the expectation we have on interoperability is that, gosh, my cell phone uh, it works with other cell phone users on other networks. Uh, surely business-to-business -business networks like Arivas and others in the world ought to be able to be like my mobile phone. If I'm, if I'm uh, using an AT&T iPhone in the U.S., I should be able to speak to you, Susie, with your, photo, your Vodafone account in the U.K. And that happens, and that interoperability has been in place and has been in place for some time. Um, where the model breaks down, of course, is that if, if I'm speaking to you in Swahili and you're speaking French, um, should you look to the networks to put in place the infrastructure and, and the capabilities to translate that Swahili into French as part of the interoperability that's, that's in place? I think, I think that uh, reasonably we, we know that's not the case. And so the, the passage of a human voice back and forth, which is the same regardless of the, the means of telephony, is, is relatively straightforward. When you start to look at complexity of business processes and marrying that up to other networks, um, that can only happen where the requirements and the risk are suitably apportioned and the commercial models uh, reflect that. Um, I think, too, that um, you know, generally uh, the investment and time and effort that many networks have put in place uh, over, over 10 or 15 years um, to, to meet the needs of buyers and suppliers to those networks um, should not be made, made available, say, free of charge to other networks that, much like the mobile telephony market, would expect to leverage that same solution. So I think, I think interoperability, Arif has always espoused um, uh, a view of interoperability and, and the ability to, to work with other networks and pass mes messages back and forth, but in a, in a way that makes commercial sense and that ultimately serves the, um, the objectives of our trading partner communities. And we don't want to you know, water down or dumb down uh, message connectivity um, you know, once we've established that uh, that type of conversation between buyers and suppliers in our own network, so it's it's a lot more complex than what uh, perhaps uh, we may have expected by by virtue of our daily use of our cell phones as we speak over the pond. I think one reason why um, the concept of interoperability um, is is um, perhaps more of a, a more of a talking point now than it than it certainly was a number of years ago is because as a concept it it makes um, e invoicing um, easier for a supplier to participate in. So perhaps um, just looking at the supplier experience of e invoicing, it kind of begs the question. Um, uh, is a, is a supplier not getting benefit from e-invoicing? Um, and uh, what's your your kind of view on what a supplier actually gains from the e-invoicing experience? Well, I think I think that that's um, really the good news in this. And and when you launch any of these initiatives, you're always looking at what will this, how will this impact my suppliers? What do I need to advise them? Sometimes there's there's aspects of the deployment that are challenging. Any change management initiative has its challenges, but with with upwards of the 600 suppliers, 600,000 suppliers we have in our network today in 130 jurisdictions worldwide in multiple languages, we talk to a lot of them, and um, many of them who've been with us uh, for a while say that what they appreciate is uh, the ability to know that an invoice has been received and validated, and knows that that it's in the system that it gets um, uh, visibility into when that invoice will be paid, and sometimes even the ability to accelerate payment on that invoice. And having been a supplier to very large companies myself, I can tell you that uh, there's no better value to a supplier than the, the ability to um, send an invoice and know when you're going to get paid for the good or service that you, you basically uh, had delivered and, and uh, uh, had performed satisfactorily to the buyer. And that there's one thing that I think an invoicing automation initiative in particular 
uh, uh, provides that's of great value to suppliers, it's painting a very clear and sometimes shorter line uh, to their cash for goods and services properly delivered. Okay, I mean, we, and again, what, what a very, very clear benefit is you've been touching on there is um, is the early payment uh, discounting option that's made available um, through electronic invoicing. So this is our final poll for the day, ladies and gentlemen. We're coming up on your screen now. So if you could tick the box which is most appropriate to your own situation, in order for my company to offer uh, early payment option to suppliers. Bearing in mind that um, suppliers see e-invoicing as, as massively attractive if they have this um, this functionality available. We would seek in return just an early payment discount, extended payment terms, um, a mix of early payment discounts and extended, extended payment terms. Uh, we would offer an option that would reduce our financial risk or perhaps you're not sure yet. So if you could tick the box most appropriate to you, ladies and gentlemen, then we will be mo moving to um, some some swift questions. We are running, I'm afraid, into what I say over time. So uh, we're moving to a five minute lock in. For those of you um, who do need to have a hard stop uh, on the hour, um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, but I do invite everybody else to stay very much on the line with their questions. So let's have a look at the results coming in now, closing the poll in three, two, one. So coming up on your screen. Um, interesting results back from this one with 43% of you saying um, um, we'd really be looking for a mix of early payment discounts um, and early and early payment um, here. So um, again, any surprises here, Peter? Uh, no. In fact, I would say that um, that's that's precisely where uh, large uh, corporates or corporates are deploying a supply chain finance solution or any working capital initiative are looking at. They're looking at what What's the best mix for me that's of the best value to my shareholders and, and uh, my organization and which uh, mitigates the risk to my suppliers and, in fact, provides them some benefit? So it would be a mix uh, generally, although okay. some would, would start with the early payment discount because that's relatively more straightforward. It doesn't involve a third-party financer and so it provides a quicker path to faster value. Okay, so uh, just quickly, ladies and gentlemen, you've got a, a couple of moments for, for questions. A lot of the questions that have been coming through, um, we have answered uh, throughout this interview. Um, but a question that it has come up is, um, as far as the banks are concerned, so obviously we talked a little bit about that, but for, for, for banks to actually penetrate this space, if this is something that they actually want to get their teeth into, a question is, um, we don't they really need to go into partnership with a with an e-invoicing provider like Ariba um, to realise this because they won't have the um, the kind of the, the skills or the capabilities to do it themselves. I think that when you, you know you will want to work with your bank partner to understand uh, capabilities, solutions, uh, people, technology, processes that they each offer, and there's a wide variety within the banking community itself as their uh, capabilities to deploy. Um, I, I think that uh, as in assessing any vendor, you would want to understand where do each of these play, um, what is uh, what is their ability to deliver, and where does the, does the provider provider more, most naturally fit. I think. One of the things you also want to do as it relates to invoicing is um, to what extent does a pre-existing, ready-to-go network of pre-enabled suppliers um, exist? And, uh, and also, to what extent can I uh, bring the best of what a bank has to offer uh, to what a service provider uh, may offer as well? Uh, service providers, uh, as by example, uh, won't be involved in providing liquidity or funding or capital to fund early payments uh, by way of a supply chain finance program. So there, banks necessarily need to be involved. Um, but uh, beyond that, you need to also say, well, how are they able to uh, get me going quickly and where is their expertise lying and track record lying in, in actually enabling a supply chain solution, not a supply chain finance solution, but a supply chain solution. So. Um, um, I, I think it's also broadly telling, just very quickly, is that it, it's telling, too, of the need to uh, deploy e-invoicing solutions. Uh, it's becoming a, a crowded provider space, which indicates that there's uh, much work to be done here. Are you also, um, if we stay with supply chain financing, which I, I, you and I both agree that this will be something that will be 
recognized increasingly as a fundamental part of an e-invoicing business case. Um, first of all, are you seeing uh, supply chain financing being a much more central uh, part of a business case? And, and secondly, I'd just be interested, without naming names, but what do you think it does to a business case? Well, I think I think you need to make, whether it's supply chain finance or anything else, part of the broader business case. And let's not forget that e-invoicing has very compelling value at the, at, at the, with respect to taking cost out of just automating your invoice flow, and you need to get that done first. Um, so uh, once you do have that done, if you're looking for that incremental next level of value, um, you know, it, it, it could be simply to monetize early payment discounts that you've not monetized before. And if you're looking even beyond that, you may want to look at, you know, what do I need to do with respect to uh, extending uh, my, my days payable outstanding, for example, my DPO to industry standards if I'm a little bit uh, behind the curve on that. And that's where SCF can, can certainly, um, you know, grease the skids of obtaining that objective. But I would, but I would simply, simply hasten to say that you should not look at SCF uh, as a value in and of itself acting in a vacuum. I think you need to look at the broader opportunity and make sure that all the pieces fit because it is, it is uh, a multi-piece uh, opportunity. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that has taken us to the end of this interview. Uh, Peter Lully, thank you very much indeed. It's been fascinating um, understanding more about um, the e-invoicing market and the, the future direction and the role of, um, of various different bodies within the invoicing space. So um, I'd just like to draw your attention, ladies and gentlemen, to our upcoming webinar program. Uh, please do book in your diaries, our webinar for next week, and you can see uh, we have um, some more webinars to be scheduled into your diary after that. Um, also, for your calendar, we have the AP Tech Summit taking place in December. Very pleased to say that Ariba is our lead sponsor at this conference in London and um, you'll have an opportunity to meet with key members of the Ariba team um, should you be coming to that. And of course, we have the European Summit for Leaders in Financial Services and Outsourcing, again in London in March, and again thrilled to say that we'll be working, um, we'll be having a 